So there's two for loops. You know, one that goes to the end, and then the other one goes to I'm bubbling up the you know the JF or the N minus I element at this point. Very simple. If you're out of order, swap them. And you just keep repeating over and over again. Okay. So just just kind of do it like you know my fingers make a nice you know, visual of this. Uh, so I'll just show the example of the order comparisons for a very small array. You just basically just compare those two, swap them. Compare those two, swap them if necessary. Compare those two, swap them if necessary. And then convince yourself that at that point, the rightmost element will be the largest. With the smallest, you know, whatever. I'll just say, well, in general, I'll talk about sorting from smallest to largest. It doesn't really matter. Um, so at that point, the, the element on the rightmost part is locked. It's done. Uh, we know it's there, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. So then we just repeat. We do the same thing over again. We now, you know, take the bottom two elements, swap them, take the next two bottom elements, swap them, and then we're done with that. And then finally, we can make one last comparison to see if those are out of order, and then we're done. Right? So with this very small array, you know, just a couple little comparisons and a few swaps, and we're good to go. Okay, so um, if you learn nothing else from this talk, I want you to please take away that you should never, ever, 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 ever <laughs> use bubble sort. Okay, it's like the worst possible sorting algorithm in existence. There are actually slightly better ones that have a similar you know, sort of structure and are just as easy to understand. Bubble sort has this reputation for being like the absolute worst algorithm you can use. It actually always takes the same amount of time to run, and it takes you're actually doing the most work that you could do to sort this array. Like, you, there's no way to actually do more meaningful work than this. Like, without just like wasting time. Right? Uh, so, uh, if you think about it, it takes uh, exactly. So, if you think about the number of swaps you're doing, you're doing, you know, n compares and then. N minus one compares and then n minus two compares. So if you think about like one plus two plus three plus dot 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 n n squared minus n over two. Uh, so it always takes that in the in computer science terminology. I'm not going to expect you to know all the computer science terminology, but uh, we call this O of n squared, which basically means the order of magnitude of n squared. Um, you know, just put one once over of what the big O notation is. It just means basically take the biggest term. And it's roughly that. It's roughly going to be n squared. The, the n isn't going to contribute a whole lot. The half isn't going to contribute a whole lot. It's that n squared that's the big part. Uh, and that's and that's bad. And we can do a lot better. And we can do a lot better without you know being very difficult to do. So um, let's talk about a sorting algorithm that's actually useful. Uh, this one's called a merge sort. Um, this description is actually a little bit long-winded, um, but I like to be a little bit precise in case I need to. Um, but so this is a recursive algorithm. So if you're familiar with recursion, it means it calls itself. In this case, so like you're going to merge sort something by merge sorting it again. But so you'll merge sort something by saying, oh, if this array size one, it's sorted. So done. Otherwise, split it in two and merge sort the two halves. And then merge from the two halves does the same thing. It splits it up into pieces. So you split it in two again until you get down basically to things of size one, and then you sort of merge them back together. The merging is fairly easy because you're always merging two things that are already sorted, and that's actually pretty easy. If you think about it. You're always basically having like a list of things that's sorted and another list of things that's sorted. It's pretty easy to output a sorted array that contains all of those. You just kind of start at the leftmost side and just kind of move your fingers over one at a time, outputting the smallest element. Pretty straightforward to merge. Um, I'm going to do a little visual example of this. So, assume we've got down to the part where we've broken it all down into pieces that are size one. That first part's not really interesting where we're you know, just breaking it apart into halves. So now we're down to the part where they're all ones, then we just merge each pair, and now we have oops, and now we have you know four things that are size two, and then we then merge those, and we get two things of size four, and then finally we merge those again, and now we have one thing of size eight and we're done. Right. Uh, so conceptually this is pretty simple. This also totally works. Like this is a very valid sorting algorithm, it's a great sorting algorithm. Um, this is sort of just a little bit of analysis on exactly how I come up with this term. But basically, this doesn't take n squared, even though it seems to be doing a similar amount of work to bubble sort. It's actually doing n times the logarithm of n. If you think about why that is, um, just briefly. So you know, at this point, we split the arrays into size one. That's really the important part of the algorithm. And then we glom them array, uh, glom them together. Sorry, into n over two arrays. So you know, half as many arrays of size two, right? If you think about that, that always takes exactly n operations to do. You know, basically, whenever you glom them together, you have to basically just iterate through each of the little arrays once, and then that outputs a big array. So that takes n steps, right? 
uh, because you're doing it for n over 2 pairs of things. Right. So then you do the next level up, you have uh, n over 4 sizes arrays of size 4, so that again takes n operations. Then you sort of dot, dot, dot that until you're at the final step when you have two giant arrays and you merge those, also takes n operations. Uh, and then if you add up all of that, how many ends do you have? Well, in this case, if you have how many ends, the number that you would raise 2 to to get to n, which is the log row. Right? So 2 to the 1 equals n, because you're, you know, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, dot, 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 n. Uh, so that's how you get n log n. Uh, what's n log n? That doesn't sound that much smaller than n squared, I hear you asking. So uh, I thought, I don't really like these visual graphs, because actually I think that these don't show very well on visual graphs. Um, on exactly why this matters, I just put in a couple little plots, uh, or not plots, but just like a little table of numbers to sort of like show you why this matters and when this matters. But sometimes, you know, maybe you don't really care. For like if you have an array of size two things, bubble sort of actually finishes in one step. So that's fine, and you know, it takes, it takes two steps technically to do merge sort. So maybe, maybe you know, that's okay if you have two things you can bubble sort. Um, once you have ten things, though, you might notice that, huh, now I have to, now I have to do 45 things. It always takes exactly 45 operations to do bubble sort, and merge sort always takes, you know, about 33, thing, 33 operations. I'm using the word operation very loosely here, by the way, like to mean like a comparison of swappy thing. Um, there are, you know, you can get down into very precise definitions on comparing swaps versus compares, and you can care an awful lot about that. But for this purposes of this talk, we're not going to care too much at this point. Uh, but for the most part, it's about 33 somethings to sort and rate that size. Uh, for the size of 100, now it starts to get kind of hot. Now you're really seeing the difference between n squared and n log n in terms of size. So it's like 5,000 operations ish versus about 660 operations. Yeah, it's starting to get too easy. You know, you think to yourself, well, my computer runs at 2 gigahertz or 3 gigahertz. And, you know, very roughly speaking, those first things do correspond to operations in this, you know, within an order of magnitude or something like that. So, you know, your computer can do billions of things a second. What, what's a few hundred versus a few thousand? Not a huge deal, actually. Uh, let's start when we get to a thousand. Now we're talking 10,000 versus 500,000. That's starting to get to be some serious difference there. 500,000 is an awful lot of some things to do just to sort a thousand things. And a thousand is not unreasonable. And neither is a million things. A million things is a very reasonable number of things to sort sometimes. If you think about when you start working in big data, or you start working about like a list of like people in the United States or something like that, you know, these things are not incomprehensibly large. And you're starting to talk about millions. And the difference here now is it takes 20 million operations to sort it with merge sort versus 500 billion operations. You know, no matter how fast your laptop is, 500 billion is going to take it a few seconds or something. Maybe even a few minutes. Uh, so now you're really, you really have no choice. You really have to switch gears and use merge sorts, kinds of things. And finally, when you get to a billion things, and a billion again is not outside the realm of possibility of the size of things you really want to sort. We're talking 29 billion, 30 billion operations. That's not so bad to sort a billion things, 30 billion operations. That sounds very reasonable to me. But 500 quadrillion operations. I can look it up to make sure it was quadrillion. It's quadrillion. Uh, which is like almost to a quintillion, it's half a quintillion. Uh, huge, huge number of operations. We'll never, ever, ever run bubble sort on something that large. Just no, 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 no. Done. Bubble sort sucks. Um, and almost every sort, so the reason I talk about these two is that almost every sort that we could talk about will fall into a category that is either very similar to bubble sort or very similar to merge sort, at least in the way that the algorithm sort of works. Bubble sort sort of things always do sort of this n squared like thing where they like loop over every you know pair of elements uh, you know in almost every combination thereof um, and uh, that's why they all are uh, n squared so insertion sort selection sort binary insertion sort if you ever are going to have to use one of these and sometimes you do binary insertion sort and I can talk about that if we have any extra time it's pretty cool. Uh, and then there's the fast sorts, and these are work by dividing problem. Basically, you look at a set of things, and since sorting has such a nice structure, you know, it's pretty easy to sort of break it into two problems, solve each of them independently, and then combine them back together. And that's how almost all of the fast sorts work is in a very similar way. Shell sorts kind of weird. Uh, but the other ones do work, you know, actually deep sorts also kind of weird. But quick sort and merge and tim sort work basically by splitting the problem up and then kind of combining it back together. 
Okay. Uh, are there any questions about sorting algorithms before I go on? Into the land of C. Uh, well, you, you made a little aside there. You said sometimes you have to use, use one of these slow sorts. Why would that? So okay. So a reason why you would want to use a slow sort instead of a fast sort is well, very few times, uh, and the times are whenever you have no extra memory. Sometimes to do like if you're say like on an embedded CPU and you don't have enough RAM to run uh, some things like merge sort or even like say the instruction space. Like double sort is very simple. And merge sort, it's also fairly simple, but it requires a little bit more space because you have to keep track of all the versions when you have to keep So sometimes you might be forced to use that just because of how simple they are. And also, um, the other reason why you might is because if you get down to very small arrays, like say 32, 64-ish size, some of these are actually going to be a little bit faster because they don't like use a whole bunch of extra memory. They make less copies. And whenever everything is like, whenever you have like 32 somethings, they fit so well into the CPU cache that it really almost doesn't matter how badly you sort it because you know you're hitting the cache every single time versus dumping a bunch of extra auxiliary data out. So you actually tend to find they work a little better up to about size 64-ish on modern processors. I see you have a question. And the other thing is that if your cost is dominated by the cost of exchanging elements rather than the cost of uh, comparing elements, then you want to use selection sort, which will give you a linear number of Exchanges guaranteed, which is kind of nice sometimes. Um, yes, uh, and then I'll, uh, as an alternative to that, uh, so I'll just repeat that selection sort gives you a fixed number of exchanges, which is n exchanges. That, that's, that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, so if you're limited by number of exchanges, like memory copies are very expensive, that's a problem. And on the flip side, also binary insertion sort uh, limits the number of comparisons you have to do. But I think it's the smallest out of any of these. By you know, if you're familiar with binary search. Or like bisection search, you know. So this sort of idea again of if you have a sorted array, you can easily find an element in it by just looking in the middle and saying, is it on the left or the right? And looking in the middle, is it on the left or the right? So as insertion sort, as you're building that sort of sorted array, like bubble sort does, rather than building it one piece at a time and finding the next biggest and the next biggest, it just says, okay, take the next element that's there and insert it correctly into the sorted chunk. That's how insertion sort works. And binary insertion sort says rather than doubly doing that. Let's actually like do a binary search for the correct place. It turns out that basically minimizes the number of comparisons for an n squared sort because it uses n log in comparison. Yeah, it's still n log in comparison, so it's not it's a constant factor that's that's optimized. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does selection sort do constant uh, constant number of comparisons? If it yeah. does no, 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 no. It does n squared comparisons, right. but it does but it does n exchanges. So like you yeah. said, the case is when you have very slow memory. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And merge, merge sort, have, uh, on the flip side, merge sort can also work very well when you have more things that then fit in RAM. Like, so this is very popular back in, like, say, like the 60s and 70s, yeah. whenever you might have these massive tape drives that you had so little RAM. And so you could actually, you know, well, if you think about it, you could actually have several tapes. Like, say, you're reading one tape, or reading another tape, and then writing another tape. And, like, as you're sort of, like, cycling through them, you know, you can do these very simple operations to output a sort of tape without actually using much you have to have a little bit of state to keep track of the merges you're doing and which tapes you're pulling off of. This way you can sort very, very large data sets. Um, yeah. Okay, so, oh yeah, one last thing I wanted to note here. Uh, by the way, if you ever get, like, you know, in an interview with Google or, you know, a lot of, a lot of places, it's actually a fairly common interview question uh, in some interviews to ask you, can you tell me about a sorting algorithm that is n log n or not or lower than n squared and tell me how it works? Got that nailed right now. So just like you know, <laughs> study the slide or think about it, some more, read the Wikipedia entry I highly recommend. It's got some nice visuals as well, um, and you'll totally nail it. It's all about understanding that you divide and conquer rather than just blindly compare things. Right. So you'll ace that interview question at least. Um, okay. Now let's talk about the implementation details. So I'm a programmer, so I like to program things. That's how I understand things a lot of the time. Um, and I really wanted to learn once about sorting. So there was this cool algorithm called TimSort. I gave a whole talk on this once on how TimSort works. But I wanted to learn about how TimSort works. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, TimSort is a Python sorting algorithm. It was invented for the Python community to um, basically be a faster sort that you know, minimizes the number of comparisons in exchange for more memory usage. So sort of a little bit about the opposite of what uh, we were talking about. Um, but the problem is in Python, if you think about the way Python or Ruby or Java works, you have these big objects, potentially very large objects, and they might have very slow comparisons. 
you know, you think about like, oh, I've got to make a function call, and then I've got to execute like random you know, Python bytecode that might have to go through multiple layers of translation. These things take a lot of time. So you really want to minimize the number of those. And if you can try to minimize them you know, by exchanging them for more memory moves, you should. Um, and so that's why TimSort came up. I want to learn about this because TimSort is something you don't learn about in school. Um, at least you didn't back whenever I was in school. Um, so I thought, oh, this will be fun. And then I also found out that I didn't have an implementation for C, and I was working on some problems where this might be useful, like sorting very you know, weird, large C objects. Um, so I thought, oh, you know, I'll write an implementation in C. That would be fun. Uh, and I'm like, well, while I'm here, I might as well write a whole bunch of other sorting algorithms so I know how good it is. And it's really hard. You don't want to compare apples and oranges, whatever you're talking about sorting. So I wrote a little library. <clears throat> so let's talk about C. Um, so when, thinking about, when people think about C, they probably, if I had to poll people, they would probably say it's old, it's very fast, and it's very difficult. Um, and that's, that's all very, very true. It's probably in that order, too, but it is really old. It's about, I think it's just that it's like 40, depends on exactly when you count the birth, but it's about 40 years old now. Uh, between 40 and 45 years. Uh, so um, it is very fast. It is almost as fast as you can get in terms of a language because the compilers are pretty good and the language is very, very simple. Uh, and difficult, well, it is difficult because it's so simple and you get so little from the language. There's not like a standard library or something silly like that. It's a bit of kind of sense. Um, you don't have objects or anything like that. You do have a little bit of a standard library that gives you like memory allocation. And that's it. Do what you will as long as you don't need a standard library. Um, and also, the way that C works, I don't know how many of you have done C programming. How many of you have done C programming, just to show up hands? Okay, well, that's, I don't want to talk to you too much about this, but you know, as you all know, uh, C compiling, you compile it ahead of time, and you distribute these awful binary libraries around, and you have these little .h files that tell you what is in your awful binaries that you pass around. Um, so that's, and we'll talk in detail about that. Um, and so I decided I'm going to go ahead and make my library in C. Uh, and that's fun, uh, but really, if you think about it, C and C++ library distribution, as I just hinted, and also almost any other compiled language, the dependency management and library distribution systems are the worst. And by worst, I mean they don't exist. There is nothing. There is no node packet manager. There is no Python, you know, whatever. There's no Ruby gems. There's nothing like that. There's just nothing. Uh, you know, you just, you just get nothing. Uh, this is why you have operating systems. Operating systems are basically package managers for C. <laughs> like, really, we had to invent Linux to manage our binary packages. No, I'm kidding. This is actually what Linux does, right? It is just a house to put your stupid C programs in and have them somehow, you know, get you know, sorted out. So obviously this is a terrible problem, and plus compiling sucks. Nobody wants to pass around binary objects. I don't want to have to compile my library 50 times on every different platform with every version of Linux, with every, you know, blah, 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 and distribute that. Nobody wants that. That's terrible. Furthermore, another problem that I sort of alluded to is C does not have generics. So it's very difficult to do things intelligently. If you have like a list of integers, you can do a, you know, fewer nicer things, or a few nicer things than you can with like say an array of strings that you want to sort. Strings are a little bit harder to compare. Uh, integers are very, very easy to compare. Um, typically, the way you solve this, solve this in C, I put air quotes for those of you listening. Uh, you solve this in C by casting to void star. Void is like the lack of a type, basically. Saying like it is, it is an array of something, and I don't really care what. Like that's that's how you solve that problem. And you get these functions like the there is a quick sort and a heap sort typically in the standard library, not actually guaranteed, but usually there. Uh, it says you know I'm going to sort an array of stuff, and I don't care what stuff is, and I'm going to do it with that size basically. And you're going to pass me in a function that tells me how to compare things, and it should you know basically be a function that just doesn't care the types, it just compares things, it doesn't care what they are. This is kind of awful. Um, this also has an interesting corollary in that you have to make a function call for every time you want to compare something. Um, and this is actually not all that useful because function calls can be very expensive. If you're, if you're in C land, then you probably care an awful lot about how fast your code runs. And if you make extra function calls that you're doing n log n times or n square times, that's a lot of function calls. And so you might, that's going to start to add up. It's a non trivial cost. Okay, so if, you know, if you've seen this sort of problem before, the one that's typical solution is you might think, okay, well fine, I'll write a generic version, and then maybe I'll write a whole bunch of simpler versions that know about how integers work, and how about floating point numbers work, and about how you know, strings work, and maybe if you had, like, maybe I'll have a couple of different ways to compare strings. Maybe people care about case sensitive. And so you realize this, this quickly gets out of hand. There's a lot of ways to compare strings. 
Yeah, you might have one that reverses it automatically when it's, you know, there's like, there's so many different options, so many different things people will want. This gets really out of hand, and it, it's sort of limited utility because the second somebody says, oh, now I want a UTF-16 sort, you know, or I want it, whatever, now, now all of your libraries are garbage except for the generic version, which is the whole problem. So, we can do better. So, I'm going to talk about a really cool trick that will actually, with a little bit of work, it's going to be, you know, this isn't going to be for free, this isn't like the end all be all, but with a little bit of work, we can do better than both of these problems. We can solve the dependency problem and the generic problem in one go. So, I mentioned whenever I was talking about this, you have that super compiled library that you pass around, and you have this .h file, this little tiny .h file that, you know, normally you just put your function names in there and you might put like a couple of constants on how to call your code. Turns out, you know, could you, I always thought to myself, could you just put everything in the header file? Like, why not? Why can't you? It turns out you can. Done. End of talk, right? No. <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's not really that simple. So, if you're going to do this, there's a whole lot of caveats. If you're going to put a whole bunch of code in there, it has to be the most, it has to be the most boring C89 code ever written. It's got to be, C89 is like one of the, is it an old, old standard that like Microsoft C compilers still use. And so if you're going to, you know, be fair to Windows user, which people complain if you don't, uh, then you have to, you know, compile using just C89, no, no cool flags to speed up your code, no, like, using, like, new features sometimes. You just have to write really awful looking C. Okay, okay, fine. You know, I guess I can live with that if I'm going to put everything in a .h file and sort of solve these problems, I can, I can sort of live with that. You know, I can live with writing C89 if I really have to. We still have that generics problem though. Like so, another problem you're going to have though is with that .h file, right? Is you you know you sort of include it once, and are they going to include it a bunch of times in their code, and won't that conflict? And there's some problems we have to work out. So let's let's uh, and we don't want function pointers, but they function pointers. Okay. So the next thing that comes to mind is to write the sort in a macro. Like if you're familiar with macros, macros in C are basically like ways to copy and paste stuff. Really, that's all a macro is. In this case, I'm defining a macro called quicksort. Maybe I pass it in the type, and maybe I then, you know, like have a whole bunch of code where I like make quicksort int, and then I declare it, you know, using quicksort int in there. Um, it's kind of not fully formed if you think about this a little bit too hard. You're sort of copying and pasting in code. Um, you know, it's really hard to actually write functions in macros, and also you have a problem with unique names. If you start like defining functions in macros, it gets kind of out of hand um, and kind of difficult. Plus, in this case, you'd have to like physically like write out quick sort int and then call it. It's kind of it's not it's not quite there. It's not it's not the end of the world. But um, what I consider kind of the bad part of this is if you want to start writing like functions in macros, it starts looking really awful. And see see and see macros are actually on one line always. Um, just because of the language has like that feature, so you have to do these line continuations. Uh, plus, whenever it like physically copies and pastes it in, the compiler usually throws away all the line number information because this is all on one line, remember? And so, if you have a bug, you know, God forbid, we ever have bugs in our code, and like if, you know, you see like a compile error or something like that, you're going to get totally worthless information from the compiler. It's not going to tell you what line it was on. It's just going to say something wasn't right in there. Good luck. Right? And especially with some of these sorting algorithms, some of them are very complex. We don't really want to like, you know, try to debug all this stuff. Um, so this, this, is not, this is not quite there. Okay, so a C trick that I only learned about you know, maybe a few years ago after doing C programming for decades, basically, um, is something called token pasting. And at a glance, this seems really worthless. Right? So token pasting is a neat little thing in the C preprocessor that actually says, okay, I'm going to take, if I say, if I write ABC pound pound XYZ, what the preprocessor does is it actually glues those two tokens together, and you now have ABC XYZ. So if you had these before, even if, say, they were valid identifiers or whatever, now you have a new identifier. You know, or if you had, you know, an identifier and a number, now it becomes an identifier. Basically, it actually like, physically takes those tokens and glues them together before the C compiler ever gets to them. Um, so this seems kind of weird. What am I talking about? Why am I talking about this? So the neat thing is we can use this trick for generics. Uh, so this is a really cool trick. This is actually taken from the library, and I can probably show the library code uh, in a few minutes. So basically, uh, the way you want to use this library is say, you know, in this case, we want to define like the sort type and the sort name or something like that, and maybe give it a name like int. I want to have a sort, a quick sort of ints, for instance. And then so I have to do some sort of C preprocessing garbage to get this to work. The problem is, is if I just called it, you know, sort concat, int and like quick sort, it would actually give me like 
or if I try to pass it in, if I did x and y, like, it actually sometimes like actually like piece together the x and the y, and it's not how we want. So we have to do like this extra layer of indirection because of the order in which the preprocessor runs things. But for the most part, this is an implementation detail, sort of because of the way this works. You know, the, the moral of this is you have a sort make screen, and you give it quick sort, and now I have into quick sort. So now I can dynamically define function names in C. Um, and that's, that's really kind of what we need to do generics. Basically, I want to be able to redefine the functions and pass in a type. If you're familiar with C++ like function templates, it's basically re-implementing function templates in C. And this gets us all the way to generics, basically. Um, so in this case, and to get around that problem, I think I even have a solution in that other slide, the function and macro definition problem, I really only define the names. So I just say the quick sort name is now going to be sort make stream, your sort name and the word quick sort. And then I can just you know blast out the function in like a normal like C function. And it looks great. Now we can have generics. Uh, this gives us this gives us all the way there. So the way you would use this library in this case is you define sort name, like you want to say it's my my sort. You just need to give it something so that it has a unique name. You define a type, in this case I want to sort roots. If it's a complex type, like it's a struct or something else, then you might want to do, or like pointers or something like that, then you might redefine the comparison function. By default, it does just like a less than or greater than operators. Um, and then you include sort.h. And now you have my quick sort, and it sorts ints, and it knows how to sort ints, and it sorts them facts. Right? Pretty neat, I think. Um, and everything, like it was declared so that, I think I talked about this. Oh, yeah. So, all the functions in there we have to then undefine it at the end. This way you can include the sort.h file multiple times and get multiple sorting functions. So this way if you say you wanted an int sort and a float sort in the same code you can. You just have to include this twice. So sort of like taking advantage of like side effects in, uh, in the CPU processor to give you generics. It's really cool. Um, yeah. Um, and that's really most of my talk. Um, so I've open sourced all this. Um, you know, this, this, I can't take full credit for like figuring out this trick. I think another programmer showed it to me once and I was like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, what kind of craziness is this? Like, how do you do generics? Like, um, actually, they, did, they didn't quite do generics and everything. They just basically did it to redefine functions sometimes and give them different names. Um, and I, I, I did it and use it to get generics. Um, I created a sorting library, sorting is cool, contributions are welcome, big fan of open source licensing. Obviously, I'm here at open source groups, so open source is cool. Um, we have a whole bunch of implementations of things. We've got shell sort, binary insertion sort. I think the website still is, yeah, heap, quick, merge, in place merge, selection, tim sort, and then there's these two new ones that I have no idea how they work. Uh, rail and square root sort. Like, never heard of them until the contributor was like, oh yeah, here's, here's these two new fancy sorting algorithms. Uh, and they are huge, like the code base for them is monstrous, but apparently they're very fast. Um, I don't, I don't know, this is the beauty of open source code. Like, I don't even know how half my code works anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah, all sorts of crazy things in there from like Russian hackers that just like, you know, like love the sorting on the library. So, um, it's getting adopted in some big projects like XNet, the Vexamilk who uses it now, and a few other places I've seen it around the internet. Uh, so it's getting, it's getting to be kind of popular. Um, but yeah, if you, if you want one sorting algorithm, you get all the rest for free. So, you know, it's, the beauty of it is that you don't actually Compile in the code. So if you, if you use just quick sort or you use just tim sort, you know the other functions will basically just get edited out by you. You know, so you only are really paying the cost of the functions that you need. Uh, so it actually solves some of that dependency management problem as well. But so yeah, so the dependency thing of this is you just pass around this dot sort dot h file and that's it. There's no library. There's no dependency management. It's just its own little self-contained dot h file. Keep it in your code base. It's fine. Um, yeah, so any any questions? I can also pod the code if people are actually curious on how it works. Um, but it's basically exactly how I said it. Yes, question. So once you've stuck the sort in the header, mm -hmm. if you use the old style thing where you pass a function pointer for the comparison, the compiler should be able to inline that yes. anyway and get rid of it, right? Yeah, so this is a benefit I, I did not mention, yes. Uh, so if, when you pound define that sort of comparison, it could be something with a function pointer or something like that. But the compiler will be smart enough to inline it. If you also define it to just be a function, like you just say, my sort comparison is this function call, your compiler can inline this. And that makes it a whole lot faster. You save the function call. And if it's very simple, like it's maybe just a couple of subtractions or something like that, or maybe just a couple of member accesses into your structs, 
it'll be very, very efficient. But I guess my point was so that you could provide a key sort style interface anyway, right? Yes. Um, and that it wouldn't hurt anything. You're not going to lose any performance from that, and it might be an easier interface to manage than one with all these magic macros. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there could be a few sort of, sort of things we'll... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the macros, I don't think the macros are too terribly hard to use. Uh, I mean, this is all, all the user has to do is just kind of define these two macros and then include them with them. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, you could, we could do you know, a very similar sort of library thing. I do have, I think, wrappers in the test suite so that I can compare how fast they are. It turns out the function, like if you're sorting a list of integers and you use the built-in quick sort or the built-in heap sort, it's like a factor of 10 is slower because sure, the function calls have so the function calls haven't been inline. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's you need to get the functions inline, but the traditional way to do that is just to make them available to the compiler so that you can do single source compilation. Right, but yeah. unfortunately with like you sort something like that, you don't have the source, right? You have a .o file or a .a file, right? And so you have no way, it has no way right. to very well inline it. Most compilers can't inline that. Right. So yeah, so, yeah. It's pretty neat, but yeah, so about a factor of 10 increase for simple structures. And plus, you get a wider variety of sorting algorithms for maybe more complex structures. I haven't actually, so if you are interested in sorting algorithms, which it sounds like a few of you are, contribution is welcome. And I haven't done a lot of the optimizations that really need to be done for things like quicksort. I use a very, very basic quicksort. There's a lot of intelligent uh, things you can do. There's a lot of research out there on quicksort and how to make it better. If you actually like, read the source to qsort.c and things like that, they've done, you know, they actually spent some time going through and cleaning it up. And I haven't done any of that work. I've done a very basic quick sort just for, you know, apples to apples-ish comparisons. Um, so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in the library to just clean things up like that. Because um, I did it mostly for comparison. The tin sort implementation is pretty good. Um, that's the only one that all I swear by is really good. Actually, the heat sort implementation is pretty good, too. Uh, but yeah, some of these could use a little bit of love. Um, yeah, it's fun. Stuff. I love sorting. Um, yeah, any other questions? Um, I'm yeah. just wondering if about debugging, I know C, I think of optimization, so I don't necessarily think of ease of debugging, but mm -hmm. like, I've used a SDL port for, uh, for C++, and you, if you're iterating off the end of the container, it would tell you the mm -hmm. debug mode, um, and it would tell you exactly the line right here. Is there any thoughts of how this for debugging, or is it just for optimization? This is mostly for optimization. When you're in C land, you're talking about optimization, there's not going to be a lot of balance checking or any other kinds of niceties like that. Um, you know, so basically the interface for all these is you pass in the stuff and then the number of elements of stuff. Uh, so you're right. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we'll never, you know, be indexed out of bounds or anything like that. I won't say that the code is totally bug free, but I do have a pretty thorough test suite. Um, I leave a lot of testing. So it like goes through and it like just beats the crap out of it with tons of different crazy array scenarios and um, does a pretty thorough job of making sure that, you know, these sorting algorithms work and that they're stable or not stable and identify. So stability sometimes matters if you don't want to like reorder things that are equal, you want to preserve the original order. So it identifies which of them are stable and unstable. Um, so I'm usually pretty confident when I push a release out there that it's, I say release, but you know, whenever I push the GitHub, I always do it with the confidence that it passes a very thorough set of tests. Other questions? I'm happy to go through the code as well. Um, I don't know how much time we have. Uh, here's the five minutes. Me oh, fine. Yeah, is the only mention of square roots or So I don't know. Those those names may not be the right names. I have a link to the paper. Uh, so I did at least track down the paper because the guy, I don't even know how he found out about these or like implemented them. I haven't really done a thorough code review of it. Uh, the yeah, Grail sort and square root sort are based on a paper from like the early 90s on how to do these like sort of merge sort sort of things in constant time and then square root sort is in square root time instead of in logarithmic or not square root time, sorry, square root space and constant space. So it had so I haven't really done the detail of it, but it, it's kind of complex and I really want to dig into it at some point. But, um, I don't actually know what they should be called as far as grail sort or square root sort. There are there aren't like cool names like there are for the other sorts because they're not very well known as far as I know. Um, and I'm not sure if they should be well known because I don't know if they're any good. I haven't really done a lot of thorough tests to compare like, how they are against, like, say, an optimized quick sort implementation. Uh, but that is something I would love to do. I would love to do more research with this code. For now, it's just something I did on the side for fun, mostly to learn how Tim's sort works. You know, I had some fun. It was fun. Uh, I also have some other libraries I've worked on. So, like, I have a similar sort of generics and C implementation of vectors, 
So, you know, a resizable array, if you've ever written a resizable array in C, they all look the same. You know, it's always like, is the capacity of this array big enough? If not, re -outline. If it is, stick it on the end and increment the size. Like the same code over and over and over again in all of these libraries I've written, or code I've written. So I just wrote a little .h file again that basically builds a type dynamically that says, this is an array type, call the append, call the delete, you know, and call like it has an index of it and things like that. Um, and at some point in my life that I've lost the code for this, uh, I had a hash table application that did the same thing. It would dynamically create a hash table type, you know, and it has you know, some very basic hash table structures in there. You could have a hash table of whatever you wanted, and it would automatically do probing and you know put it in the correct spot and then deletion and all that kind of stuff. At some point I'll rewrite it and put it back up there. Uh, but sorting is I think the cool thing. Um, but you can do this, you basically build, use this trick to build any sort of typed generic data structure in C. Well there's no type check. I mean we should be really clear about that. If you, if you mix the if you mix calls to several of these different maps, oh, yeah, it'll just fail. No, no, absolutely. It's, it, yeah, yeah. it's not going to do strict type checking, but it will. But you will be calling int quick sort with that floating point array, and so you might you might think twice when you're writing the code. Hopefully, you know it will be a mental type check. The, code, the compiler's not actually going to care. It, you can still abuse cast it to void star and do whatever you want, but it will like at least be able to take advantage of the fact that those are floats and they have an optimized subtraction, right? Uh, as opposed to just throwing them in queue sort with a function pointer and then just paying the penalty. Any other questions? All right, I'm all be around. So